against all these threats and challenges to life. Constant progress of research in life science and tight collaboration in relevant industry chains are essential for achieving better vital quality. Originated in 2002, RWD has been constantly furnishing customers with reliable solutions and services in life science, animal health, and clinical medicine, and dedicated for better vital quality within our wits and powers. Our products have been sold to over 100 countries and regions around the globe, and won worldwide customer confidence and support. At RWD. We launched six solutions in the fields of life sciences, animal health, and clinical medicine at the forefront of the world, including animal surgery and modeling solutions, which ensure experiment efficiency through diverse animal disease modeling and model evaluation techniques. In vivo imaging solutions, which provide tangible tech support in fields such as biology, pharmacology, materiology, and translational medicine, among others, by accurately showing blood flow and changes in other indicators of live beings in visualized imaging. Neurosignal research solutions, which are valuable tools for neural circuit analysis, as well as research into mechanisms for neural system diseases, development of brain-machine intelligence technology, and more. Histopathology solutions, which improve the quality and efficiency of pathological diagnosis while sectioning with high accuracy and efficiency. Cellular and molecular biology research solutions, which should advance efficient scientific research through covering all conventional experiments, including cell separation and purification, cell coloring, cell analysis, and molecular biology. Animal diagnosis and treatment solutions, which evaluate diagnostic efficiency and treatment efficacy of surgery with anesthesia, dental services, rehabilitation, and physiotherapy. Urinary system diseases, etc. And our assistants, science researchers, have published thousands of papers in a number of world-leading academic journals, including Nature and Science. On top of that, many scientific research institutions, medical institutions, and pet diagnosis and treatment centers have attained their success by leveraging our six solutions up to now. We will maintain cooperation and innovation with an open mind. Boosting growth within many industries through joint efforts with our partners. So we've been collaborating and cooperating with RWD for quite some time now, and their self-developed products have helped us in the laboratory、uh, maintain accuracy and improve accuracy, and in help our efi efficiency. We've used everything from cryostats for sectioning various organs of the body. All the way through to stereotactic surgery solutions to deliver small amounts of virus to very minute regions of the brain. We're really happy with our delivery of this product, and we're really excited to see what they've got in store for,、um, and their future products that they have in store for the future,、um, and helping researchers worldwide. My name is Dr. Heinrich Kollebusch. I've been for 30 years a practicing veterinarian, and for 20 years we've been working with treatment with the narcosis technique in the clinical practice. Our veterinarians. Treibt das Wohlergehen unserer Patienten an, sowie die ständige Verbesserung ihrer Lebenserwartung und ihrer Lebensqualität. RWD hilft uns dabei mit hochmoderner Beatmungstechnik und ebenso modernen Lösungen für Diagnostik und Therapie. RWDs Hilfe können wir Tierärzte sicherer und effizienter operieren, aber gleichzeitig sorgt RWD auch für eine verbesserte Lebenserwartung. Das Wohlergehen unserer Patienten und die ständige Verbesserung ihrer Lebenserwartung und Lebensdauer treibt uns Tierärzte an. As a national high-tech enterprise, RWD ascribes great importance to technology research and development, based on four technical platforms, including optical imaging, precision transmission, accurate temperature control, and detection of weak signal. We have a grip on leading core technologies across many fields. Since RWD's funding, the company has invested hundreds of millions on research and development, gaining almost a hundred patents, both domestic and international, as a result. In addition to its sound manufacturing base, 
Advanced Processing Assembly Line, and Precision Detection System. RWD has built an integrated control system that monitors all aspects of operations from research and development to manufacturing. The name RWD comes from the transliteration of the English word reward, meaning payback to society. Reward is not only the original aspiration of the creation of RWD, but also the continuous belief of the company. In 2016, RWD launched the RWD Preclinical Medicine Enlightenment Scholarship to help with the development of research talent in China's preclinical medicine. So far, the scholarship has been awarded to 38 institutions of higher education nationwide. As the Vice President Unit of the Huxil Wildlife Conservation Society, RWD has donated medical equipment and supplies for wildlife relief and the conservation of the natural ecosystem. In 2020, RWD donated clinical medical supplies worth over RMB 1 million to the Giant Panda National Park to help with safeguarding our national treasure. In the future, RWD will continue to contribute its wits and powers to enhance vital quality and help global customers unlock vital mystery and safeguard vital health. Hi, Dr. Brooke. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to participate in the Reward Academy webinar. Reward is a life science focusing on animal health field and we've been funded over 20 years. Our product, including the anesthesia machine, including the laser therapy machine, ventilator, and absolutely dental unit. So we started reward academic column to transform more knowledge to our wet groups. And today our topic is periodontal disease and therapy. Because the, um, periodontal disease is the most common problem in small animal veterinary industry. However, sometimes the patients were poorly treated due to the lack of understanding of the disease process and the limitation of instruments. And today, we are pleased to invite Dr. Brooke Mimic to share his knowledge and experience about the oral disease and taking us to explore more treatment methods. Dr. Brooke is a board certificated specialist in the veterinary dentistry in both the American and Europe veterinary dental colleges, as well as a fellow in the Academy of Veterinary Dentistry. There are only about 10 West who hold all three of these certificates all over the world, and Dr. Brooke is one of them. Moreover, he is past president of the AVD as well as the AVDC dedicated to the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. And he is recognized internationally as one of the leading authorities in the veterinary dentistry. Furthermore, Dr. Brooke has published numerous journal articles at the local, state, national, and international levels. With such an inspiring experience, we chat. Dr. Brooke will deliver a fascinating lecture to us. All right, I will pass time to Dr. Brooke. And audience, if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to type them in the chat box or type them in the Q&A module. And Dr. Brooke will answer them after his presentation. Right. Can you start? All right, thanks, Paige. So she sold a little bit of my thunder um, in the standpoint that I talk about um, when I talk about periodontal disease. Um, it is by far the most common problem in small animal pets today. As a matter of fact, number two isn't anywhere close. Um, the, the, when you talk about the incidence of gum disease, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more um, when we get uh, a little further into this lecture, is the fact that when we have these diseases, uh, the classic studies that we've talked about, 80% of dogs at two years of age have some degree of gum disease. 80% of dogs? Is there anything that you see in your practice that's anywhere close to 80% of patients have it at any one time? 
Okay. So from that standpoint, um, it is the most common problem. But here's the crazy thing. Those old studies from the 80s underestimate the true incidence of disease. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The other thing as far as a means of introduction, and yes, she hit all the highlights of my career, uh, but I think the most important thing for you guys to understand throughout the world, really, is that I didn't do vet school, internship, residency, and then start working in a specialty center. I spent five years, five years of um, working in a general practice. So I know what it's like to work in a general practice in poor areas of the United States. So I know what it's like to have your clients. So what I do here is that I try and give you the very uh, client-friendly, general practitioner-friendly ability to uh, educate people about gum disease and then hopefully treat it correctly. Go ahead, Paige, next. Next slide, Paige. There you go. So the reason that I know so much about this is that I did literally write the book on this subject. Um, the book in the top left corner, I wrote about six years ago, seven years ago um, on veterinary periodontology. And the stuff that I learned as a board certified dentist was amazing. And that's what I tell people all the time. Most of what you were taught about gum disease is wrong. Um, and I'm gonna fix that today, hopefully. Um, this book, um, and as well as the book in the far right corner, The Oral Pathology, those are written by or published by international publishing companies. You can order them online um, from anywhere, Wiley or CRC Press, or heck, if you have Amazon or Alibaba or wherever you're at, you can get those internationally. The extractions book is only available off of my website. And then down in that far left corner, that's a QR code that goes to my Instagram site. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it's just Dr. Brooke Nemec. I have a lot of quizzes and stuff like that on there as well. Next. Okay. These are normal gingival tissues. They're coral pink in color. There's no plaque. There's no calculus. There's no redness. This is what you want your animal's mouth to look like. Heck, this is what you want your mouth to look like. The problem is it took me two years to find this dog to put him in this lecture. Why? Because he doesn't exist in nature. And that's really sad. The vast majority of, veterinary, of, of animals out there have gum disease of some level, yet we as a profession have allowed a certain amount of gum disease to be considered normal. But it's not normal. It's an infection. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But this is what we need to start moving towards as far as an ideal for our patients to keep them nice and healthy. Because what you're going to find out is periodontal disease is a very serious problem. Next, please. Okay. This is a normal dental radiograph. There's that you can see the bone fills up the area between the furcation there. It comes all the way up to the neck of the tooth. So this is a normal dental radiograph. We see this more often than we see no, no inflammation, but in and of itself, we don't see it often enough, especially with small breed dogs, as we're going to get to in a little bit. Next. Okay. Pathogenesis. Next slide. Okay. This is the most important slide of the first half of this lecture. So everyone that's out there, wake up, pay attention, because this is critical, okay? What is the cause of gum disease? It's plaque, okay? Not tartar, not calculus. We'll get to that in a minute. Plaque is the cause of gum disease. So we need to understand what plaque is before we can um, officially and effectively treat it. It's kind of like the old saying, understand your enemy before you can defeat him. So what is plaque? Plaque is a biofilm. What's a biofilm? A biofilm is a layer of bacteria on a surface. And biofilms are everywhere. There's a biofilm on my phone that I'm, I'm holding on to. There's a, uh, a biofilm on the table in front of you. There's a biofilm on all of our skin. Biofilms are not necessarily bad. And the vast majority of living creatures, bacteria, live in a biofilm. The problem is when it's allowed to get built up, like on teeth that are non-shedding, that's when they become pathogenic, okay? So a biofilm is a layer of bacteria on a surface. It is almost all bacteria. They ultra centrifuge plaque to get more bacteria into it. They couldn't. It's all bacteria. So if you guys got up this morning and you scraped your teeth like that and you got that white creamy stuff on your fingernail, or if you flossed your teeth and you got that cream cheese on your floss, do you know what that is? bacteria. That's all it is. Eventually, it becomes calcified by the minerals and saliva to become calculus or tartar. What's that? Calcified bacteria. 
Okay. So the big important point of this is that plaque forms on teeth in 24 hours. You guys tomorrow are going to go out and do the most beautiful job cleaning these animals' teeth. They're going to sparkle. They literally should be so clean you could eat off of them when you're done. The problem is the next day, they're coated in plaque. In just three days, gingivi or, um, in just three days, it's, um, uh, it's already starting to become calculus. And in two weeks, gingivitis has started again. Okay, What does that mean? If you're doing annual cleanings on your patients, but you're not doing any type of home care, those pets are infected 50 weeks a year. It's not good care. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So one of the important things to talk about is that we all know that, back, that periodontal disease is a bacterial infection. It is. It's caused by bacteria. But here's the criti two critical points to remember, because everyone wants to use antibiotics to treat, okay? They, everyone wants to use antibiotics, okay? Plain and simple, you can't use antibiotics to treat periodontal disease for two reasons. Number one, the bacteria that cause periodontal disease are bacteria that are normal inhabitants of the oral cavity that are just allowed to be built up. It's not like if you have a urinary tract infection, and it's a E. coli or a pastorella or some bacteria that got into the into the or um, into the bladder or a pneumonia where a bacteria that doesn't belong in the lungs got in the lungs. You treat it with antibiotics and it's gone. The problem is when you treat periodontal disease with antibiotics, the back it does kill the bacteria for now, but then unfortunately those bacteria are still there, and as soon as the antibiotics are gone, they come right back. So you cannot treat it. Everyone wants to stop using antibiotics. We'll get to that in a little bit. The other reason why you can't use antibiotics to treat oral infections is because if you look at that slide, they are 1,000 to 1,500 times more resistant to antibiotics. Why? Because in a slime layer, in a slime layer, you, um, uh, you, you, the, the bacteria protect themselves. So if you take a singular bacteria and you put it into a plaque biofilm, it becomes much more resistant because they can defend each other. They have, it's called quorum sensing and all this kind of stuff, but it really decreases the ability for the antibiotics to get into that plaque biofilm and kill them. I call it a bacterial fortress, okay? Oh, well, I want to use this rinse. Well, the problem is with rinses and water additives, some of them may work, but it's 500,000 times more resistant than that singular bacteria. So how do you treat periodontal disease? This is the key, mechanical removal. Brushing, scaling, extraction at the end, we'll talk about that. That's how you treat gum disease. Next, please. Okay, another thing that needs to be taught, and if you read human periodontal textbooks, the, they are dedicated chapters, chapters, not just a sentence or a paragraph. There are chapters donated to smooth root surfaces and restorative dentistry in human textbooks for periodontal. Why? Because human dentists know that if you don't have smooth tooth surfaces, you're going to get way worse plaque and calculus. And the way I explain it is if you have a glass wall and you throw some rice against the glass wall, most of that rice is going to slide right down the glass wall. But if you have a textured surface and you throw that same rice against it, what's going to happen, or oatmeal or whatever, it's going to stick. So if you have a roughened tooth surface, it's going to cause increased plaque and calculus and hasten periodontal disease. So as part of your complete periodontal care, you should be smooth root tooth surfaces. So um, there are some things that are really common, some things that are less common, but the two most common things that I find that cause rough and tooth surfaces in, in general practice, especially in dogs, are enamel hypocalcification and uncomplicated crown fractures. Go to the next slide, please. This, is, this on the top left is an, um, an uncomplicated crown fracture. This means when you talk about crown fracture, tooth fractures, complicated means that the root canal is directly exposed. So you can see the pink or the brown or the black. An uncomplicated crown fracture does not mean there's no complications. It just means that it's not directly exposed. So you see that little blue arrow. It's pointing towards an area of tooth that's been lost. 
first of all, that does hurt and can be infected. And in my mind, needs to be treated from an endodontic or root canal problem, okay, or restorative dentistry problem. We could talk about that in a later lecture if they want. Um, but what's happening, if you see how dirty that tooth is and how you're already getting gingivitis on it, because you can see those white arrows, but the teeth on either side are clean. Why? Because that tooth is a rougher tooth surface picking up plaque and calculus faster. The one on the bottom right is a 10-month-old dog with enamel hypocalcification. Look at how bad those teeth look. Again, just because they're rougher, they're getting way more gum disease. So you need to treat it. How do you treat it? Restorative dentistry. It's actually fairly simple to do. Next slide. Okay, so restorative dentistry should be part of any periodontal therapy. Bonded sealants are dirt cheap to get into. They're easy to perform. Composite restorations are a next step. I do teach it in San Diego in March. I think it's March 11th next year. Something to learn, something we, that, that labs are great for. Next slide. So here's just an example of what you can do with the restoration. Again, on the top left is a pre-op picture of a dog that has hypoplasia that's 10 months old and has horrific disease and all that tartar and, and it's all rough. And, and all of that dark area on those teeth is all painful like a cavity. We smooth it all out, put a sealant on, and it looks like this almost as good as new. It's never going to be quite as smooth as nature intended it to be, but it's going to be a lot better. The dog's going to be non-painful um, and gum disease is going to be decreased. Next slide. Other things that can cause gum disease, um, gingival enlargement in boxers, especially, um, crowding in pugs and any small brachycephalics like Frenchies. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So here on the top right is a French bulldog, and you can see how those teeth are crammed together. He's only about three years old. He was in for that fractured upper fourth, but he's got a 10 millimeter pocket between those teeth. So when you see this crowding, the current recommendation is to extract one of those non-strategic teeth. I'd take out that third premolar so it creates room between the second premolar and the fourth premolar. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see that gingival enlargement that creates what's called a pseudo pocket, allowing periodontal disease to, to get in there and cause disease faster and faster and faster. So that should be trimmed down. Okay, next. Okay, supra gingival plaque. This is the initial plaque formed above the gum line. Okay. Once it gets into calculus, it can get really thick and nasty. But see that red down there? Everything that you can see on the surface of the tooth does nothing to this patient. So everything you can see on that, on that slide on the bottom left, everything you can see, it, it doesn't do anything. They did a study with people whose mouths look like this, and yes, it happens, where they cleaned the surface of the tooth, left everything at and below the gum line. Zero resolution of disease. Vice versa, they cleaned everything up underneath the gum, left all that nastiness on the surface, 100% resolution of disease. Now, does the, does the surface of the teeth need to be cleaned? Absolutely, absolutely they do. But here's the thing, until this is, this is probably the most important point of this entire slide, or this entire lecture. Until you're cleaning up underneath the gum, you're not doing anything medically for this patient. That's why I talk about not all plaque is, is created equal. Super gingival plaque, like our little friend in the bottom right corner, not all plaque is bad. It's the stuff up underneath the gum that causes the problem. Next slide. Okay, subgingival plaque. The subgingival plaque is where we start causing inflammation, where we start causing issues to go on down there. The deep, when you get up underneath the gum, the, the bacteria changes from aerobic to anaerobic. And it's the anaerobic bacteria that create the smell, the infection, and create the bone loss. So you've got to clean under the gum. Next slide, please. Okay, I told you it's not tartar. Gingivitis and periodontal disease are typically associated with calculus, but not always. You can see completely clean mouths that have bad disease and vice versa. And oh, by the way, if you have subgingival calculus and you clean the plaque off of the calculus, the gums will heal to the calculus. So you need to take this out of your mind. Everyone has been taught, flip the lip, look for tartar, flip the lip, look for tartar. No. Do not make your decisions on whether an animal needs a dental dentistry based on the level of tartar. Go to the next slide, please. 
Take a look at this dog. Okay. Do you see any tartar there? These teeth are pretty darn clean, but look at how much inflammation he has. He has horrific inflammation. If you would have determined your level of disease and need for cleaning based on tartar, you wouldn't recommend a cleaning on this dog, but he absolutely needs one. Next slide. Vice versa, look at this cat. Do you see any gingivitis there? No. He's got horrific, and I mean horrific tartar. He's got a huge iceberg of tartar running down his cheek, but no inflammation. Does this cat need a cleaning? Absolutely, but not as much as that dog does. So you need to forget about tartar, start looking at gingival inflammation. And oh, by the way, in mine and almost every veterinary dentist opinion out there, animals need their teeth cleaned every year, regardless of what it looks like. I don't care what it looks like. You cannot do a complete oral exam on an awake patient. It's been proven in study after study that awake exams do not accurately affect the level of gum disease in early cases, especially. So you need to do a cleaning every year, in my opinion. Next. Okay, you're gonna get this question all the time. Well, I've had animals all my life and I've never had dental disease. Why are we seeing it now? Well, it's always been there um, and we just didn't look for it, but we are seeing that more. Why are we seeing more gum disease than we saw years ago? Well, number one, our pets are living longer. When I was first looking at vet school and doing my, you know, working as a technician, an eight-year-old dog was old back in the late 80s. Nowadays, they're living forever. I mean, I do anesthesia routinely on my, you know, on 20, 25-year-old animals. My record for anesthesia is 26 years old, a 26-year-old cat. My anesthesiologist record is 31-year-old cat. I do, I, if I'm not doing a dog over 18 in my practice every week, I'm shocked, okay? Why else? Well, increased ownership of small dogs. I mean, which also goes along with living longer, right? Back in the 80s, what kind of dogs did we treat? We, try, we treated Labradors. We treated Shepherds and Rottweilers. Man, we treated dogs, right? What do we treat now? Yorkies and Poodles and Frenchies and Pugs and Dachshunds. And we keep breeding them smaller and smaller and smaller. I treated a 0.8 kilogram Poodle the other week. That's not a dog. It's a hamster. And because we shrunk them down, we crammed all their teeth together. We made their roots bigger than they're supposed to be. We'll get to that in a little bit. But here's the big thing. Why are we seeing gum disease now? Because periodontal disease is a genetic disease. It is a congenital problem. And it's caused by the body's reaction to the infection. Big dogs are more resistant. Little dogs will get bad gum disease. So will Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. So will, so will greyhounds. It's a genetic thing. Purebred dogs and cats have worse disease and commercial pet foods have decreased the need to chew and increased the retention of plaque and calculus. Next slide. These are my Labradors, okay? The one on the left is Kaylee. Um, the one on the right is my current dog, Sage. Kaylee has passed on. These are 12-year-old Labradors. Backpacking at 12,000 feet or 4,000 meters, we're out doing 20 miles a day. At 12, 30 years ago, they would have been dead. Kaylee lived to 16, Sage is now 13. These dogs are living forever, giving them more time to cause gum disease. Next. Okay, what does periodontal disease do? The first thing it causes is gingivitis. Gingivitis is inflammation only to the gingiva. So there's no bone loss yet. There's no radiographic signs yet. But what do we see? Well, redness and swelling to the gums. Plaque and calculus on the teeth, increased bleeding on probing, and bad breath. Huh. Let's take a look at that for a second. Go to the next slide. Here we go. See, look at where that, that blue arrows are pointing to. Redness, swelling, inflammation, maybe some, some halitosis. If you were to look at this, what's that redness a sign of? Inflammation. What's that a sign of? Infection. This dog, this dog in front of you is infected. This dog that you're seeing is dying a little bit every day because of gum disease. We'll get to that in a minute. But here's the problem. The vast majority of veterinarians would look at this dog and go, meh, it's not that bad. You know, let's wait till February. We're having a special. 
or let's wait till there's a lump that needs to be removed, right? Wrong. This dog needs treatment today. We cannot anymore allow this to be considered okay. Because what's going to happen if we don't treat it? It's going to get worse. And then what's going to happen? Well, more infection, more inflammation, maybe an abscess, but eventually you're going to have to do what? Extract the tooth. Okay? Why? Why do we give gum disease such little respect that we allow these teeth to literally, I heard it from a vet the other day, rot out of their mouth because he's eating, right? Just because they're eating does not mean they're not hurting. Go to the next slide, please. If this dog came into your practice tomorrow and he cut his paw pad, would you look at him and go, you know what? March is our last rated paw month. Come back then and we'll fix it. No, you would never do that. Because you know, if you don't treat it, now again, is this dog dying from this? No, he's maybe limping, maybe bleeding on your client's um, carpet. But he's not dying from this. But you wouldn't put him off for months, would you? Because you know, if you don't, what's going to happen? Next slide. It's going to get infected, right? And you may end up with something like this. And now you have to amputate that leg because you didn't treat it before. Which is the same thing we do every single day with dentistry. We ignore it. We don't recommend any treatment because it's not bothering the dog until we have to extract it. In my opinion, an extraction is an amputation of a, of a finger. It is because that's what a dog uses for its mouth. Is his, it, it, for his fingers or his teeth because his mouth or his hands. Some veterinary dentists call it tooth in Asia, killing the tooth because you are. And it was all preventable. We'll get there in a minute. Next slide. So here's another thing you were taught about dentistry, which is wrong. First sign of gingivitis is redness of the gums. No, it is not. The first sign of gingivitis is bleeding upon probing or brushing, okay? So if you've ever flossed your teeth at night and spit blood into your sink, you have gingivitis. You do, okay? So that's the thing is that if we're using the oral exam to determine the level of disease, it's underestimated. Go to the next slide. Here's an example. This dog's teeth look pretty good, right? I don't see any plaque. I don't see calculus. I don't see any redness. If you look back in that black right area, you can look see on the inside, there's some tartar. That's why the anesthetized exam is so important. But when you probe this dog, go ahead. Next slide. Look at how much blood is coming out. That's just one probe. This dog is horrifically infected, horrifically inflamed. But you never would have known it without anesthesia and probing. That is why I told you at the beginning, 80% of dogs were found to have gum disease uh, in the study from the 80s. Yes, that is 100% true. These dogs had gum disease that could be seen, but here's the problem. Number one, 1980s model of dog was a big dog, less, less gum disease. And number two, that was an awake exam. Using current, um, current technologies and using an anesthetized exam, here's the thing. 90% of dogs at one year of age have gum disease. 90% at one year of age. 30% of dogs under five kilos have bone loss at one year of age. Periodontal disease is not an old dog thing. It's a young dog thing. These animals get disease like that. And you need to start treating them early. What does this mean? According to Wasava, W-S-A-V-A, and probably everyone listening to me is a member of the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. If you want more information on dentistry, I think we can provide the link later. Um, the Wasava Dental Guidelines are free. They're a hundred page, basically a textbook for free. A lot of them have been translated. I know they've been translated into Mandarin um, and they're all on the website for free for you guys. Um, but here's the thing, Wasava and the American Animal Hospital Association, all dogs under 10 pounds, need their first dentistry before a year of age, nine to 12 months of age. And I know that's shocking. And I know your clients don't want to hear it, but it's true. Because if you don't treat it, it's just going to get worse. And then you're going to have to end up with infection. It's not your fault that they decided to buy a little Yorkie multi-poo that's two kilograms. You need to educate them. Next slide, please. So if we don't treat periodontal, if we don't treat gingivitis, it's going to proceed into periodontitis. Periodontitis is inflammation to the deeper supporting structures of the teeth, and now we're starting to get bone loss. 
okay? We're gonna get recession, we're gonna get pockets. Um, and this is what I like to tell people. Perinol disease is 100% preventable, 100%. You clean the teeth every six to nine months, you brush the teeth every day or do some kind of home care, these animals are never gonna get gum disease. I mean, some of them are gonna be just so prone they are, but it's 0% treatable. You have to do a better job with taking care of these patients early. Next slide. So now if we didn't treat the gingivitis because it wasn't bad enough yet, now we've got a little bit of recession. You can see the pockets there on the bottom right. Um, that's where the bone loss is. That's about a five, six millimeter pocket. The green is, is pointing out um, some, uh, some subgingival tartar that needs to be cleaned up. But we can work with these teeth. I mean, I'd probably extract that third premolar, but the fourth premolar has got early periodontal, or early furcation. We could probably fix that. The problem is this isn't where most of my patients come see me. Go to the next slide. This is. So now we've got horrific infection, pus coming out, all the teeth are loose. You've got 90% bone loss on those lower premolars. They all need to be extracted. Um, and this dog has had severe infection for a long time. So they need to be treated. They absolutely need to be treated. Prevention, prevention, prevention. You need to extract all these teeth. It's the only option to get rid of all that infection. Next slide. Okay, so there are systemic consequences and regional consequences. Every veterinary dentist believes in the regional consequences. Not everyone believes in the systemic consequences, but almost everyone's coming on board now. I'll talk to you about why I believe in it and whether you guys should or should not. But everyone believes in the, in the local consequences because here's the problem, and this is why it's such a challenge for you to get your clients to say yes to dentistry. Everyone's opinion about the worst case scenario of gum disease is bad breath and tooth loss. If that's what you're telling your clients, oh, if we don't take care of the teeth, they're going to be extracted. Your clients are going, eh, who cares? These are the things, especially with small breed dogs that we need to talk about. Oronasal fistulas, class two perioendo lesions, eye, eye issues, jaw fractures, an increased risk of oral cancer, and osteomyelitis. These are all things that are happening within the oral cavity secondary to periodontal disease on a regular basis. Next. So this is an oronasal fistula, okay? There's a hole between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity now. And every time this dog eats or drinks, everything goes up into his nose, causing a chronic infection. Remember, the rest of the mouth is looking good. You, it's especially in dachshunds, especially small breed dogs, but especially dachshunds, they get really bad gum disease on the inside surface of that upper canine. So you need to treat this. Next slide. This is what it looks like after a tooth a upper canine's been extracted, if it's not closed correctly. If you guys are having problems closing this, I would strongly recommend taking a hands-on laboratory. Um, they teach it all, they're, they're taught all over the world. Um, maybe I'll do a webinar in the future about it. It's much better to learn by doing a, um, doing a, a class that you just have to uh, do something called fenestrating the, um, fenestrating the periosteum. Next slide. Okay, treatment, once it goes into the nose, the only option you have is to make a flap and close it. I prefer minimally invasive surgery techniques. I'll talk about at the end of the lecture, um, but you've got to make a flap and close it with no tension. Next slide. If you catch it before it gets into the nose though, we can do periodontal surgery and save it. Um, it doesn't work in all instances, but it is a problem um, that we can treat. But if you guys don't know how to do guided tissue regeneration, you got a 10 millimeter pocket, that tooth should be, should be extracted. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Next slide. Okay, what else could periodontal disease cause? Well, eye loss. Why? Because the tooth roots of the upper fourth premolar and the molar teeth are right below the eyeball especially in small brachycephalics like pugs and bulldogs. Um, um, when you go into, someone's coming to go, what suits your, uh, what suits your material? I'll pop in really quick. I'll answer this at the end as well. Personally, personally, Dr. Nemec uses gut. That's all I use. I use chromic cat gut, 3-0 in dogs, 4-0 in cats. Most veterinary dentists don't use it. Um, they use monocryl. And that's fine. I just find that monocryl is in there way too long, in Brooke's opinion, okay? Um, I really like gut. So go to the next slide. Okay, so take a look at this dog on the top right. That's not an abscess. That is, his, that is what's called vitreous humor pouring out of this dog's eye. This dog's eye popped, just like our little friend at the bottom. What happened? See the, the picture on the top right? The, that's a dental x-ray of, um, of, um, 
uh, of the upper first molar. And you can see that big periapical lucency there. And then you can see the zygomatic arch running across that. This dog had a chronically infected upper first molar. Eventually it got so bad, the eye popped. When I talked to an ophthalmologist about this, they said that by far and away, the number one cause of orbital issues in dogs is dental. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is what's called a class two perioendo lesion. This is where the tooth gets infected when the bacteria get all the way down. So you can see the big pocket on the distal root of that upper first molar. The infection ate all the way down to the bottom of the tooth, got in, killed the tooth, got into it, just like a broken tooth. Like if a tooth's broken, it gets the bacteria get in from the oral cavity. In this situation, the, the infection has come all the way down to what used to be the blood supply. So the bacteria gets in through what used to be the blood supply and kills the tooth. And you can see the infection on the mesial root. So it can cause abscess teeth as well. I mean, this truth isn't truly abscess, but it is infected. Next slide. Okay. So this is a case. This is why dental x-rays are so critical. One of the, one of the first reasons, I mean, I'll show you some other slides too, but you've got to have x-rays because if you didn't have an x-ray to tell you what this jaw looked like, you would probably have broken the jaw taking out that lower first molar. I certainly would have. You still might, but at least you have legal and medical reasons as to why the jaw broke. So you can see on the bottom right of that or bottom left of that x-ray, that little uh, black area, that's called a, that's called a, um, a fibrous union. So it's not broken yet, but it wants to break. And then you can see that there's nothing holding on to that distal root, the front root, the mesial root. There's th the only thing holding the jaw together really um, is the area up where, where the furcation is. So taking this tooth out is really scary. So unfortunately in most of the world, that's your only option and you've got to take it out because if you don't, the jaw is going to break anyway. But what we do as veterinary specialists, go to the next slide. <clears throat> is we cut the tooth in half and we take out the back half. Go forward, Paige. There you go. So we cut the tooth in half, take out the back half, and then we do a root canal on the front half. So on the left is the post-operative radiograph. On the right is our six month recheck. You can see all that bone grew back in and it looks really good. So you don't necessarily have to take these teeth out. And this dog got to keep half of this tooth forever um, because we got rid of the infected part. So again, if you don't have anyone that does root canals correctly in your area, taking this tooth out is the correct way to go because you have to, but you got to tell the client that it's probably going to break the jaw and be super careful with tiny little instruments getting it out. Um, I, I tell people all the time, if I had the opportunity to refer this dog, I'd have referred this dog. Next slide. Okay. So this is another reason why it's so important to take dental x-rays. So this is a about two kilogram poodle. And what you can see, can you see at the bottom of that mesial root, there is almost no bone left. There is 0 0.3 millimeters of bone there. If you look at this dog jaw, dog, dog's jaw wrong, it's going to break. If you try and take it out without sectioning it, without being ridiculously careful, you're going to break the jaw. I would have. Okay, so this is where I talk about you need to have super duper small instrumentation and you absolutely really need to be taking care of these patients. Okay, so from this standpoint, you got to have x rays. And oh, by the way, this is a normal dental radiograph. Of, or, uh, okay, where the root ends in relation to the bottom of the jaw is normal in small breed dogs. When we shrunk these animals down, and we did it, we bred them, we shrunk them down, they have smaller roots than uh, our smaller jaws in relation to their teeth. Small dogs have larger first molars, especially compared to their larger counterparts. Go ahead, go to the next slide. Okay, same thing in lower canines. See where those arrows are pointing? You've got 0 0.2 millimeters of bone normally there. So especially in dachshunds and cats, you need to be really careful not to break the jaw taking lower canines out. Next slide. Okay, here's the example. On the lower right, okay, where you see those white arrows, this is a dental radiograph of a 40 kilogram Labrador. You've got three centimeters of solid bone below the roots of those teeth. You can't break the jaw. Trust me, you can't, okay? But on the top left is a four kilogram dachshund. It has less than a millimeter normally. So you've always got to be careful taking out the lower first molar of a dog under say three kilos. What I tell people all the time, you have to take out the lower first molar of a dog over, say, 10 kilos. Don't worry about it. You're not going to break the jaw. But if you have to take out the lower first molar of a dog under five kilos, be afraid. 
And if you have to take out the lower first molar of a dog under two kilos, be very afraid because they usually have bone loss on top of it from periodontal disease and there's no bone left there. So you got to be really careful. Next slide. Speaking of which, this is a pathologic fracture. So the bone weakened, 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 and then the dog broke its jaw. Usually this is a dog fight or falling off the couch or stairs. Usually it's minimal trauma in an older to small breed dog. So if you have an older to small breed dog that has a questionable history of trauma, like not hit by a car or a baseball bat or something like that, it's something that just happened when that, that is minor trauma and it, the dog's not acting super painful, think pathologic. Okay. And especially if it's around the lower canine, but it's specifically around the lower first molar. Okay. Next slide. The reason it's important to know about pathologic fractures is that they will not, okay, they will not heal with that infected tooth root in there. That infected tooth root is a nidus of infection and it will not heal if you leave those tooth roots in. So these are older pictures. Surgeons used to not know about this. They're learning about it now. So this is less of a problem now. But the one on the left is the seventh plate put on by a board certified surgeon. And the one on the right is, is the third KE, again, put on by a boarded surgeon. And the reason it didn't work was not because they didn't do the surgery correctly. It's because they left in the infected root. So you've got to have a suspicion for it. You've got to have dental x-rays, which will allow it to heal once you take the roots out. Next. Okay, oral cancer, just like skin, um, skin cancer from exposure to the sun, smoking and lung cancer, chewing tobacco and lip, lip, lip and cheek cancer, chronic inflammation drives the oncogenes, which drives oral cancer. People, and again, there's no studies in animals on this one, people with periodontal disease have an increased risk of oral cancer. Next slide. And so here it is, just increased risk of oral cancer. No, not everyone believes in it. This one I wouldn't push too hard, but I believe in it. Next slide. And the last local effect is what's called osteomyelitis. On the left there, that's not tartar. That's not dirty teeth. That's bone. And on the, on the right is the dental x-ray. You can see on the left, high, left side of the screen, all of that, that periosteal reaction, all that muddled bone. This dog's entire hemimandible, his whole right side of his mandible is dead and infected. He lost his whole jaw. Why? Gum disease. So when it comes to talking to your clients about gum disease, don't just talk to them about bad breath and tooth loss. Talk to them about jaw fractures, eye loss, nasal infections, oral cancer. Those are the things that are happening to your patients, especially small breed dogs, dogs under five kilos, if you don't treat periodontal disease. Go ahead to the next slide. But now we're going to talk about the big guns. These are the systemic effects. The systemic effects happen because the bacteria get into the bloodstream through the inflamed gingiva and they go throughout the entire body. Because remember, when you have inflamed gingiva, the capillaries are leaky to allow the white blood cells into the bloodstream to fight to get off to, um, or it allows the white blood cells into the gingival sulcus to fight off the infection. The problem is that opens the floodgates for the bacteria and their byproducts to get into the systemic vasculature and infect the entire body. A couple really important points here. Number one, it's just gingivitis. Just that thin red line of gingivitis or bleeding upon probing is enough to create these systemic effects. But here's the big one. This is the one that everyone's gonna have questions on. Everyone sit up straight, don't fall off your chair because you're all gonna do it because this is the number one thing I get questions about. They go on and on and on and on and on about it. The bacteremia induced by a cleaning or by an extraction is the same level of bacteria that is developed by eating dinner. When you are cleaning the teeth, I know, trust me, I know, we were all taught antibiotics, 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 antibiotics. You have to use antibiotics for dentistry because of the bacteremia. No, you don't. That was because we did studies in, or they did studies in humans and animals in the 80s. And they found that when you did an extraction, you developed a bacteremia. And it's true, you do. Whenever you do a cleaning or an extraction, you develop a bacteremia. However, you also develop that eating dinner. They forgot to do blood cultures. They forgot to do a control. All those studies are flawed. They forgot to do a control saying, hey, what happens when you use a toothpick or floss your teeth? Guess what? Same level of bacteremia. So what does that mean? Stop using antibiotics. Stop. I know everyone uses antibiotics. Everyone in the entire world. Stop. We stopped over 20 years ago using antibiotics, essentially ever. We never use antibiotics anymore. Like almost never. I say never is a strong word. Oh, by the way, just give you a couple little things. 
the bacteremia that you set up is gone by the time the patient goes home. So that patient came in on Tuesday morning. It was horrifically infected on Monday. Did you give him antibiotics? No. He was horribly infected on Sunday, eating dinner. He showered himself with bacteria. Did you give him antibiotics? No. You get him under anesthesia, you clean the teeth. Do you develop a bacteremia? Sure. By the time that animal touches the cage, before it even goes home, the bacteremia has been dealt with by the body. So you removed all the infection in the mouth, right? You used all the infection in the mouth. You, you got rid of all the infection, whether it was cleaning or extraction, right? Okay. You removed everything in the mouth. The body dealt with any bacteremia before the dog went home. So what the heck are you treating with antibiotics when you sit at home afterwards? Here's why. Do you know why you do it? It's because it's what we've always done. Stop using antibiotics. I like, I can't remember the last time I prescribed antibiotics unless you have actual bone infection. Now, if you're going to pre-treat a dog with, with um, you know, an abscess to knock the abscess down, sure. But he feels better when the abscess breaks. So next slide. Okay. So what do they, what do they cause? Now, I told you that not every veterinary dentist believes in the systemic effects. They're coming around. I've believed in them for 20 years. They're coming around. But what are the organs that are affected? Well, in humans and dogs, there is a study on heart dysfunction. The heart function is decreased in people and dogs with gum disease. Endocarditis is increased in people and dogs with gum disease. Although by the, and oh, by the way, there is no link between endocarditis and doing a dentistry. Okay. It's not doing a dentistry. Okay. Um, kidney, heart, heart and kidney. Kidney has been proven renal disease. The number one risk factor for chronic kidney disease in cats is periodontal disease. The number two risk factor for, per for chronic kidney disease in cats is moderate periodontal disease. So people, dogs and cats all have renal disease as a consequence. Um, humans and dogs, liver disease. Chronic inflammatory markers, specifically um, C-reactive protein in humans and dogs. And in humans and dogs, Alzheimer's and cognitive dysfunction. It has been shown that canine cognitive dysfunction is co or correlated to bad periodontalities. Next level, next slide. In humans, go to the next slide page. Okay, in humans, arthritis, especially rheumatoid arthritis. Diabetes mellitus is probably the number one thing in humans. I mean, it's so strongly correlated, it's ridiculous. I don't know about animals, to be honest. Go back, you went, you went, went, went too far. Um, in, uh, in humans, it, it also can cause pregnancy effects. It can also cause um, um, early death. I mean, people with bad periodontal disease have an increased risk of early mortality. In one study out of Scandinavia, it was a um, higher risk factor for early death than smoking. But here's the flip side. You can stay on this slide now. Here's the flip side. Treating periodontal disease, okay? Treating periodontal disease. Um, go, go to the other slide. It seems like we're a little bit delayed here. Um, so we talk about the, the benefits of doing cleanings. On the human side, if you have chronic kidney disease, if you have diabetes, and you take care of your teeth, your diabetic control improves, your GFR improves, your liver function improves, your heart function improves. And in humans and dogs, it's been proven that your cognitive function improves. So when you have these animals with comorbidities that can handle anesthesia, it's even more important to treat the teeth. Next slide. Come on, baby. Next slide, Paige. It seems like our internet is slowing down a little bit, unfortunately. There we go. Thank you. Okay, geriatric anesthesia. That's where you want to be, okay? No patient is too old for anesthesia. Plain and simple. I've heard this forever. Oh, your dog's 12, he's too old. No. And here, there's another thing. There is no such thing as a pet too old for anesthesia. Age is not a disease. Age is a natural consequence of not dying. If you don't die, you get older. In and of itself, age does not increase the risk of anesthetic. It doesn't. But what it does do is increases the chances that we have other problems 
that would confound anesthesia. So we just need to work them up. Next, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna talk and hopefully the next slide comes up. So basically you just do have to work these patients up. You need to get blood work on them. Definitely need to listen to their chest. Uh, if they're older patients, if they have heart murmurs, then they should definitely get um, definitely get an ECG done. Um, and definitely I like chest x-rays if there's anything wrong. Um, and then based on this, if everything's normal, if everything is normal on this, there is no increase in risk. End of story, there isn't. I mean, maybe this much, but there's not really any increase uh, of anesthetic issues. Um, so you absolutely need to work them up. And if they're safe, I don't care if the dog's 20, I'm gonna still do them, okay? Next slide. We're getting close to being done. The internet would be a little bit happier. We'd be <laughs> working a little better. So you need to establish a, a baseline. And if a pet's got a creatinine that's just over high normal, I don't really care. It doesn't increase the chances of anesthesia problems. You just need to monitor the blood pressure well. Even pets with moderate derangements. Again, because we're better veterinarians, because we have better treatments. I mean, look at Pimo Bendin. I mean, 15 years ago, pre-Pimo Bendin, if you had a dog that was in heart failure, it was going to live for another couple months. And that's it. Now with Pimo Bendin, he's going to live for a couple years. So you can't stop treating the teeth. You have to treat it as long as they are a reasonable anesthetic candidate. Next slide. And oh, by the way, there's a study out of North Carolina that did that showed that it was not an increased risk of anesthetic death um, or morbidity or mortality with, with a heart murmur, plain and simple. Oh, by the way, if you guys want, that's my website, vdspets.com. I have client educational videos on all forms of veterinary dental problems. So if you just want to go to that website, um, and again, it's in English, obviously, uh, but the, it uses pictures and x-rays. There's Most of what I discussed in this lecture is in there. If you don't want to spend all the time talking to your client, you can just send them right to that website. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to spend the last few minutes of this, of this lecture talking about how do we treat gum disease, okay? So how do we treat gum disease? So... Home care is a critical part of periodontal therapy. We already talked about this, plaque forms in 24 hours, calculus in three days, gingivitis in two weeks. So home care is absolutely critical. Go ahead to the next slide. There are two types of home care. There's active home care and there's passive home care. Active home care means that, the, the, that, that you actually have to do something. Passive means that it's just diets and treats. Okay, plaque control. It's a four-pronged attack, depending on how bad the disease is. The first step is always a cleaning, okay? Get everything nice and clean. Um, if you have pockets, then you need to either do closed root planing, okay, with some antibiotics or some kind of um, uh, parasitic or flaps if it gets really bad. Home care, we started talking about, and then extraction is the cure. Next slide. I hate, tell people all the time, I hate pulling teeth, but everything else is a... Um, is maintenance, right? Extraction is the cure. So to do a prophylaxis, good balanced anesthesia, sub super gingival scaling, so cleaning what you can see. But the most important thing, by far and away, the most important part that in red is cleaning below the gum. That's why you need a good ultrasonic scaler, like the the our, the reward ones on the right there. It's a really nice scaler. You got to have a nice subgingival tip to get up underneath the gum. You've got to clean underneath the gum. If you don't clean underneath the gum, it's like you didn't do anything at all. Polishing is critical. Okay, smooths out the tooth. And then again, dental exam and charting. I, that is the second most important step, in my opinion. And then finally, dental radiographs um, to to find pathology is absolutely critical. Next slide. Okay, x-rays are critical. We've already talked about this. I've shown you this x-ray before. Um, if you don't have this x-ray, you're gonna break the jaw taking that tooth out. We all know the tooth needs to come out based on our physical exam, but if you don't know how little bone that is, you're probably gonna break the jaw. And again, from a medical legal standpoint, you know, taking doing a, a radiograph on this is critical. Next slide. Okay, when you have all the pockets being less than three millimeters in a dog, one millimeter in a cat, you're done. Okay, but pockets over three are pathologic and need to be treated. So the pockets are between three millimeters and six millimeters. We do what's called closed root planing or a deep scaling. And then I usually, and I do a combination of ultrasonic scaling and um, hand scaling. And then we add in, I like parasitics. Parasitics are the icing on the cake. It's not critical, but I do like it. And you should be charging for this because this is harder than just doing your cleaning. Next slide. 
But the problem is once you get over six millimeters, it has been proven in numerous studies that you, I, a human periodontal surgeon cannot clean pockets over six millimeters. You can't. You got a nine millimeter pocket in a dog. I know the tooth isn't loose if it's a canine of a large breed dog. You can't get it clean. You're leaving infection behind. Frication level two, if you can get that probe halfway through or all the way through, you can't do it without a flap. So, either, so mostly you guys should be extracting it. If you have a veterinary dentist or someone's trained in periodontal surgery and the client wants to save the tooth, you can. But if you don't have that opportunity, take the tooth out. Next slide. So I'm just going to give you some examples. So here's a nine millimeter pocket on the inside of an upper canine on a dog. My technician and my resident cleaned it closed. Okay, didn't make an incision at the beginning. Did a really good job cleaning the first six millimeters. But when I made that flap, can you see down at the bottom of that pocket, there's tartar down there? You can't effectively clean that tooth. So if you left that tooth with just closed replaning, you're leaving infection behind. And yes, those old days of if it ain't loose, don't pull it. No, you've got to be taking these teeth out because if you don't, you're leaving infection behind. Next slide. And it's the same exact thing with furcation exposure. Well, if you have furcation two, you can see on the top left, you're not getting that area clean. You just can't do it. Some of the ultrasonics can now, but in general, you're leaving infection behind. So again, we've got to be a lot more aggressive with extractions with these teeth, unless we can do periosurgery. Next slide. Okay. Home care, like I said, critical. Active is doing something, passive is not. Active is always gonna be the gold standard. Next slide. Brushing teeth is not is not a is not rocket science. It's just using a child soft toothbrush usually or veterinary. It doesn't really matter. You cannot. I think I saw a question. You cannot use human toothpaste because there's detergents in it. There's fluoride in it a lot of times, and dogs will swallow it. You don't necessarily have to use any toothpaste. Um, but the the Veerback product actually has been shown to help in and of itself. Uh, I don't care what kind of toothpaste you use. To be honest, I said the Veerback product in here, um, and you don't have to use anything. But it does help. Just try and you know, the more you can do, this is what my hygienist says, the more you can, the more you do, the less I have to do. Next slide. Passive home care, you know, the problem with active home care is the clients need to do it. They need to do it on a regular basis. And that's really hard. Most clients are lazy. Only 1% of clients brush their patients every day. Um, and less than 50% of well-motivated clients are brushing after six months. So they just stop. And it's got to be done. So passive home care is really the way to go for most clients. Go ahead. Next slide. The problem is the vast majority of home care products out there don't haven't been proven to do anything. Most of them are worthless in my opinion. So if you're going to recommend a product to your client, Either they should have published peer-reviewed studies, in my opinion, that's the best, or the Veterinary Oral Health Council, the VOHC, will give you an idea that the product actually works. Go to the next slide. The problem is that when you look at, um, go to the next slide, when you go to, um, when you look at it, the problem is just because they decrease plaque and calculus doesn't tell you where it decreases plaque and calculus. Because if you're just doing it at the cusp tip and you're not getting down to the gum line, again, you're not doing anything medical. So you've got to have specialized treats and, and diets. Go to the next slide. I mean, I hope that these videos run. Um, so dental diets, okay. Um, typical dental diets are like a meteor. When they hit, they shatter. And they do a really good job on the surface of the tooth but they don't get down to the gum line. So the inflammation stays. Go to the next slide. Okay, so this is, hopefully this will run for us. Yeah, okay. So this thing is gonna run. Yeah, so it's gonna run a little slow, I think. But this is a dental diet, okay? This is dry erase marker on the carnasials of, of a dog. And when you close it, see how it shatters? It doesn't really decrease the amount of tartar on these teeth. Now it does do a little bit. This would get, you know, approval because it does decrease plaque and calculus, you know, by 15 to 20%, which is what you need for VOHC approval. And yes, if you did a study, it would show that scientifically it, it does decrease plaque and calculus. But the problem is it's not getting down to the gum line. Go to the next slide. If we go to the if we go next, okay, now. If you're going to get something that's going to be effective, it's got to hold on to the tooth, like the moons made out of cheese. I don't know if you guys use that in your country, but the moon holding on to the tooth is scrubbing it all the way down to the bottom. Next slide. 
So this is, I forget which, which uh, product I'm showing you guys here. So this is the same doctor's hands. It's the same model. It's the same dry erase marker. This example is, which one is it? This is TD. So I'm not sure if your country, if you have TD from Hills Pet Nutrition. Again, I'm not paid by Hills to say this. I'm not, I'm not involved in them. I just know that TD works. See how it holds onto the tooth all the way down? It scrapes the tooth all the way and it's going all the way down to the gum line. So after one bite, you can see how it's holding on all the way until it finally breaks. Look at how much was scraped off of that tooth with one bite. So that's why I like TD because it's so much more effective than most of the other dental diets. In fact, in my opinion, it's the only diet. And I'm gonna say this again, in Dr. Nemec's professional opinion, TD is the best product to use from a dental standpoint. Um, there's other products that might work. There's other products that do work. I don't, in my opinion, there's nothing that works as well. Other products I like, I do like Greenies. I like the, the BI or that dental chews. Um, I, I do like raw hides. I do like veggie dents. Um, but again, I, I, these are what I like, personal opinion. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. We're almost done. We're going to get to questions here in just a second. So as, this, as soon as we get this, as soon as we get this slide off of here, um, the videos sometimes slow it down, but I just think they're just such a good way to, to educate people. You should be able just to advance the slide. There you go. Just advance the slide. And then extraction. Go ahead. Extraction, while it's extreme, is the cure. Okay. Everything else is maintenance. I hate pulling teeth, but that's but when you pull teeth, it's done. Next slide. So, like I said, I'm a big believer in minimally invasive surgeries. So I do small flaps if I have to. I generally do everything closed. As a matter of fact, I took out an upper fourth premolar of a, of a huge Labrador closed. I did not make a flap. Uh, small sharp instruments, um, envelope flaps if necessary, and good high speed equipment is critical. Next. All right, so in summary, um, well, this is my training center here. This is what we do. I mean, if you're in the United States, we, we did the training center in um, in San Diego and, and it's level ones in March, June and August, and then level twos in March um, as well. So that's my Instagram. So in summary, Basically, periodontal disease is the most common problem in small animal patients. It is, by, I mean, by far, it causes localized infection. It causes lots of problems in the mouth and regionally with jaw fractures, eye loss, nasal infections, but it also spreads systemically and causes heart, lung, liver, kidney problems, um, and it needs to be treated. And we need to be much more aggressive with treating it. Clients, all pets under... Um, under five kilos should have their first dentistry before a year of age. Um, cleaning, you know, above and below the gum lines critical. Um, dental X-rays are critical. Proper equipment's critical. Um, all that kind of stuff. So I am now going to slide over to the chat and answer some questions. I'll go back to the beginning. Um, okay. Uh, where are the questions? Okay. Question, 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 question. Okay. Someone in the suture, um, I, you know, I don't, if, I don't remember exactly what PGLA is, if that's monocryl. Um, I don't use PDS in the mouth. If that's what you're referring to. I think that's in there way too long. Um, you can use monocryl. You can use Vicryl. I think those are fine. I would use Vicryl Rapide personally. Um, if I was going to use something other than gut, but honestly I use gut. Um, um, I, and again, I uh, I never use antibiotics, and I don't believe metronidazole has the greatest um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for spectrum. If I was using um, an antibiotic, if I had to choose an antibiotic, um, in general, my choice is going to be um, clavulonic acid uh, amoxicillin. So clin um, clavamox is going to be my drug of choice. It's got the best spectrum for the oral cavity. If I have active bone infection, I'm going to choose clindamycin. Uh, and usually if you have a true active bone infection, which is actually pretty rare, I maybe see a, 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 something I, once a year, um, I'll use clindamycin, but you have to use a pretty high dosage of that. Um, as I think I answered this, no, you can't use human toothpaste um, because unfortunately it's going to be swallowed and there's detergents and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
Oh yeah, polyglotin is fine. I don't typically use it though. Um, I'm not sure what Saracynth is. I have never heard of Saracynth. Um, I'm not sure if that's a a name, a brand name or something. But I'm not familiar with that. With that, um, do I? No. And again, I don't. I don't use antibiotics hardly like ever. And again, we have to get back to that. You don't need antibiotics. You don't. The way to treat gum disease is to remove the plaque, plain and simple. Um, I, I use, um, I don't use antibiotics. I mean, I can't remember the last time. Well, actually, no, I can't remember the last time I pre-treated a patient on with antibiotics. Um, I, I, I have sent at home maybe once or twice a year, and we used to use them intraoperatively all the time for heart murmurs and stuff like that. We were taught to do that. I don't do that anymore. Plain and simple. Again, I, I don't use, if I'm going to use monofilament, I use, um, I use gut. Um, I don't use anything really, to be honest, other than gut 99% of the time, if I'm going to use something, um, if I'm going to use something other than gut, it's going to be monocryl. Um, do I, and again, do I use convenia? Yeah, maybe once a year. <laughs> um, you know, it does have a dental label over in Europe, but uh, again, antibiotics are, you guys have got to get out of antibiotics. You got to stop worrying about antibiotics and just treat the mouth, plain and simple. The key to removal is and I know this is crazy. Everyone, it's funny that I've been doing this for 20 years and it's taking so long to get antibiotics out. It's out. Um, do I use nerve, nerve blocks and cats daily? <laughs> Every day, everything. I, I Everything gets nerve blocks. I've been doing nerve blocks for over 20 years. I've had almost no negative effects. I think it works really, really well. I do, I do full mouth blocks in animals like literally every day um, on every patient. They all get blocks. Even if I'm just doing closed root planning or a restoration, it decreases the amount of anesthesia that you need. It just makes the animals do better. It decreases wind up and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yes, nerve blocks should be done. And again, we could do a webinar on that. I would say that for this company and for the thing, the next webinar I would probably do would be either be oral pathology extractions or radiology. Um, but nerve blocks are something really critical. No, oh, by the way, we do have an online course um, on VDS pets um, about doing nerve blocks as well. Um, well, other, the only other question I saw in here, um, you know, this, this whole question about um, clean surgeries and dental procedures um, is very controversial. We've kind of gone back and forth and back and forth on, is it okay? Is it not okay? Is it okay? Is it not okay? Um, for a long time, it was fine. For a long time, it was, you know, malpractice. And now it's kind of back to being somewhat accepted. This is what I would say. This is Brooke's opinion. Again, I would never enter a body cavity and a dentistry at the same time. Like I would never do a splenectomy dentistry or a spay dentistry, something like that. If there's a lump that needs to be removed, I think that's totally fine. If there's an abscess, if there's a laceration, um, if there's something external, let's put it that way, that needs to be done, as long as it's not massive, then I would say that's totally fine. I don't, I personally would not recommend entering a body cavity, doing a space, splenectomy, thoracotomy, anything like that um, at the same time I'm doing a dentistry. That, and if I did, I would definitely be using antibiotics, um, you know, just interoperatively though. Um, no, actually, um, um, I don't. Um, I, I know that some veterinary dentists do recommend antibiotics because it does decrease bleeding um, and it does decrease um, the amount of inflammation. But here's the thing, that, that in my mind, okay, using antibiotics to decrease inflammation is, in Brooke's opinion again, okay, contraindicated. Why? The first stage of healing is granulation tissue formation. When you have inflamed tissues, those tissues are ready to heal. All the groceries, all the stuff that needs to be in that area is there. When you use antibiotics and decrease inflammation, you somewhat delay healing because now the body's got to re-inflame it. So no, I don't use antibiotics. Um, and, and no, I don't use, I, I don't use, um, um, I don't use steroids. No, I would never use steroids before extraction. That in my mind is contraindicated because it decreases the healing ability and it decreases the ability to fight off infection. So in my opinion, steroids are contraindicated prior to extraction. Now you asked about um, methylpred, um, depomedrol, um, not gingivitis, no, stomatitis. If you have true caudal stomatitis, or you have inflammation in the back of the mouth, not gingivitis, I would never use it for gingivitis. That's just gum disease. If you have a, if you have a cat that is so painful that they're not eating, 
and you need to schedule it out a few weeks or a month, then yes, I would use steroids to make the cat more comfortable until we get to the procedure. The key is to intervene before the cat stops eating and the extraction will be the treatment in my mind is to take all the teeth out. Um, but I do use that. I do use methylpred to st uh, for stomatitis, not gingivitis. And in say steroid use before extraction, no. In say use before extraction is okay. The only concern that I have with using non-steroidals before doing the extraction, and we certainly have lots of pets that are on non-steroidals, you know, for arthritis or whatever, and we do surgery all the time, and it's not contraindicated at all. The only thing about having a non-steroidal on board in the bloodstream before you do the, or during the dentistry, say, when you give it the night before, the only negative is that if you have low blood pressure under anesthesia, you can start creating kidney problems because you're not perfusing the kidneys well. It can exaggerate the kidney problems happen with the, happening with the hypotension. So what we generally do is we get the patient under anesthesia we do the work, and if we're getting kind of close to the end of getting the work done, then we give them the non-steroidal at that point. And then by the time the nerve blocks wear off, by the time the morphine wears off, that non-steroidal has taken effect, and you've got that preemptive pain management. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with using a non-steroidal pre-op because it does decrease inflammation, and it's going to be blocking the windup. But my anesthesiologist does not recommend using it before. She always recommends if the animal's normotensive under anesthesia, go ahead and give it. If not, wait till the dog, wake, dog wakes up. And so, and just personal preference, again, this is Dr. Nemec. In my opinion, I like Medicam personally, Meloxicam in dogs. And we've started to use Onsior in cats. Um, and we've had a really good success with it. Uh, I think that those are all the questions I have at this point. I don't see anything else coming in. Um, but yeah, stop using antibiotics, <laughs> please. Um, and I know some people use steroids because they can't get can't get um, they can't get uh, non-steroidals um, in in their area. And if that's the case, then then that's certainly fine. Um, uh, okay, so last thing. Um, um, Last question, and then it's probably time to go. Um, yeah, you don't necessarily have, again, the question is, if the tooth is so loose after calculate, after removing it, you just you know extract it basically with your fingers, right? Um, do you have to suture it? Well, depends. <laughs> um, in general, no, not really. I, I tend to suture everything because it decreases blood uh, bleeding and it heals a little faster, looks a little nicer. If you don't have a fistula, like if you pluck out an upper canine, you're going to have a fistula, so you have to close it. Um, you know, if it's a lower tooth, usually you don't have to, I still do. Um, and then, um, what, what, you know, and again, what, uh, um, what, what's, what do you do if you don't have x-rays where either the client declines it, um, or you just don't have it, which again is not unusual. I, I, I actually am luckily enough to never have had to practice without dental x-ray, but I know that there's places that don't have it. Be as careful as you can. I mean, again, it goes into, you know, what is standard in your area? If you don't have x-ray, there's, there is a really, really, really good way to fix not having dental x-ray. It's called buying one. <laughs> um, I'm sure that RMD would, would be, RWD would be very happy to sell you one. They are, but I mean, I get it. In some areas that financially you just can't do it it's because your clients can't do it. It's be as careful as you can. Do as good as an oral can, do as good of an oral exam as you can. You know, based on the information that I gave you today, know that if you've got to take out a lower canine or a lower first molar of a small dog or a cat, you got to worry about breaking the jaw. Um, you just got to be careful. Small, sharp instruments, just be aware that that's a problem, that that's a that's a, a, a potential problem. Um, but, you know, again, it's life, you know, I mean, it's not perfect. I, I recommend cardiac workups on all of my patients with murmurs. Not all of them get them. You know, I mean, and again, we I, I, we have to be reasonable and understand that not all clients can afford best care. And if that's the case, then that's life. Um, but just do the best, do the best you can. Okay, doke. You're welcome. You, Dr. So, Brooke. You're Thank welcome. You. Yeah, it's a gentle remind because uh, I saw you have answered all the questions in the chatting box. But there are still some questions in the Q&A module of the Zoom. Can you see them? Yeah, I'm I don't see anything else. Oh, Q&A up there. I see it now. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Um, so that was in the other thing. Um, do I recommend brushing teeth 
press teeth regularly. Yes, I recommend every day, every every day, a minimum of three times a week, but I would recommend every day, plain and simple. Um, for cases in retained teeth, how how old do you recommend the owner? Oh, retained deciduous teeth? Oh, oh God, no, please, please do not wait till the teeth call. This is a whole nother lecture uh, about retained deciduous teeth. Um, retained deciduous teeth should come out as soon as the adult tooth erupts, not even, they don't even have to be completely in. As soon as the two adult teeth start, start, just start to erupt. As soon as you can see the little tip of it coming out, that tooth is considered retained and needs to come out like now. Um, please do not wait till they fall out by themselves. Um, full mouth extractions on feline and it's, and it's no longer, Judith, it's no longer gingivitis stomatitis. The current terminology is caudal stomatitis when you have inflammation in the back of the mouth. Um, and my stance on full mouth extractions is, yep, you should do it. And you should do it as soon as possible. I do all extractions. I mean, again, I'm a specialist, so I'm fast, um, but I take all the teeth out and I don't believe in caudal mouth extractions personally. Um, I believe in uh, full mouth extractions um, and because our success rate's higher. Um, the only other option is steroids and I don't like doing that. Um, again, I think I talked about my choices of anti-inflammatory after cleaning. I like non -steroid. I like uh, Medicam personally. And again, but on uh, on in cats, but Carprofen's fine, Prevacox fine, Duramax, they're all fine. Um, uh, I don't know that I have... Um, uh, experience with that particular probiotics, but on the human side, probiotics have been shown to decrease gum disease. Um, and so I do think that that's a helpful thing. Um, typically as far as sedation, and again, what we really should do is involve my anesthesiologist. They can do an anesthesia lecture for you guys is what you probably really need. Um, and I'd imagine she'd be willing to do that. Um, but what we typically for dogs, we typically pre-medicate with either hydromorphone um, and methadone or methadone, hydromorphone or methadone, depending on the patient. And then we, that is a pre-med and then we induce with midazolam and propofol most of the time. Um, in cats, it's usually buprenorphine or hydromorphone. And then again, midazolam and propofol to effect. If you've got a sick patient, alfaxalone is fine. Um, tramadol is not real great, unfortunately. And again, my opinion, most vet anesthesiologists opinions that tramadol is not a very good pain management, mostly because dogs don't have the, um, the enzyme to cleave it into its effective form. So we usually use gabapentin, um, either in combination with Medicam or instead of Medicam. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, th there are so many products that are out there. I'm not going to talk about any specific uh, products out there. Just do your research. Um, and, and those are the, the products that I mentioned are the products that I like. Um, and then there was one other question, dental burrs. Um, you know, there's so many different dental burrs out there. Um, there's so many different options. What I typically, and it depends on what you're using it for, right? I mean, if you're doing extractions, it's one thing. If you're doing, I think it's other things. Typically, if I'm doing extractions, I'm using what's called a cross-cut um, taper fissure burr. Um, those are number 699, 700, 701, 702, 703. Those, the, the higher the number, the bigger they are. Why it starts with the 699, I have no idea. But 699, 701, 702 are typically what I'm going to use for sectioning and extractions, which is mostly what you guys are going to be using as well. Okay, how's that, Paige? Did I get through those? Thank you. I think that that's good. Every time you said next page, I think it's meant for me to be cut off. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. I know you may have a surgery sir, and thank you so much for your for presentation and Q and A session. Hope everything goes very well with you. And also, thank you. Appreciate to our presenting audience as well. And because of the time limitation, it takes us to the end of the webinar. And if you still have any further questions, feel free to include um, our email. And welcome to follow our social media, Reward Animals Care, care for future webinar information. And thank you again for your time and attention. Bye. All right, bye.